Good evening and welcome. Good yeah, to see welcome. you all. Yeah. Is it our first Thursday in the new year? It is indeed. Oh, wow. Right. Hey, welcome to hi, Diane. Hi. Oh, I can yeah. see Diane. Diane yeah. Jade. Hi. Yes. Hi. Welcome, Diane. Probably some of you know Diane because she is a founder of National Center for Eating Disorders and uh, delivered some courses with us. So good to see you tonight, Diane. And everyone else, lots of familiar faces. Welcome to 2024. The new year started and it already feels pretty much like the old year, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, same cold weather outside. New Year's resolutions out of the window, you know, and we are starting doing the same things as before. And that is why we are running our procrastination course at the end of January, just to remind you and hopefully to help you to get back on track to start with your New Year's resolutions. But I'm going slightly ahead. So as always, first of all, uh, let me introduce ourselves. My name is Dr. Julia Budnik, and I'm director of SDS Seminars. And today's presenter will be uh, my co-director and founder of SDS Seminars, Paul Grantham. And tonight's topic will be procrastination. So while we're still gathering, and I can see people are still coming into the waiting room in large numbers, I yeah. will just very quickly share my screen. So how to find us? We are SDS Seminars, we are a UK-based company, and our website is skillsdevelopment.co.uk. Uh, .uk. Easiest way to find us is to just type into Google SDS Seminars and there's nobody else with this name, so you will come straight to our website. And as I mentioned uh, before, uh, the first event which is coming at the end of January is a two-day program called I Want to Stop Procrastinating Now. This is a program which Paul developed himself. It's completely unique uh, and uh, unique to him. And he's already run it several times uh, with both practitioners and clients. And um, you can come yourself to the course or you can send your clients who struggle with procrastination. Uh, and as we know, procrastination plays a key role in many things, imposter syndrome, perfectionism, all of these things lead to procrastination and very often affect uh, both our performance at work or students' performance at school. So it's an issue which we would like to address. So this particular event will take place on the 30th and 31st of January, done deliberately so that your New Year's resolutions could be uh, dealt with. Uh, rather than forgotten by the end of January. And I kept what I called it now late booking discount. I know it sounds very strange because if you're late, why do you have a discount? But because I know lots of people who will be signing up to this course procrastinate and it might apply to decision of signing up to this course and dealing with the problem. So to encourage our procrastinators to still sign up, uh, I keep the late booking discount of £95 plus VAT until 20th of January. So this is a two-day live program on Zoom. You can't just watch it as a recording. On this course, you have to participate because Paul will take you through all the worksheets with your partners in the room, uh, in the Zoom room, and you will do all the exercises, uh, writing down your resolutions and everything. So you have to participate. We can't give it to you as a recording. So this is the course which we wanted to mention. If you don't uh, have the opportunity to participate in this course live, 
Paul has done another good thing for you. He's written a, a course as a book. And if you go to Amazon and search Paul Grantham Procrastination, you will find this book, this very book here. Uh, I want to stop procrastinating now, a practical step-by-step -step program that solves all your procrastination problems. It, tr it, it, it is true, it does. Uh, but the thing is, if you have more than one procrastination problem, you will have to go through the book again and again and again. Uh, but that's true. It's got worksheets which you can complete and fill. And uh, it's in big font with big uh, worksheets, large worksheets. So it's very easy to work with. So that's another option. If you can't come to the course, you can come. Uh, you can go to Amazon and purchase this book. But even better, because we know that some of you will not come to the course and not buy the book. But Paul very generously decided to share some of the procrastination techniques with you tonight to encourage your journey on dealing with the problems which you procrastinate about. So it's enough of me, Paul. I'm very, very glad to uh, pass the microphone to you. Please take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Julia. And uh, good evening, folks. Let me uh, just kick off with um, sharing my screen um, so you can see where we're going to go with on this. And, and if you, uh, to make an obvious point here, we're not going to do the whole course this evening. Um, but what I wanted to do was to bring out or highlight, um, first of all, I think some common misperceptions about procrastination and to zero in on one particular technique. Uh, really, which I think probably at the end of the day um, makes the biggest difference. And, and I'll probably go beyond that, actually, and say that the sort of underlying principle of what I'm going to be talking about briefly this evening, I think, is actually a key life strategy with a whole range of problems. Um, but I think it's just particularly pronounced with regards to procrastination. And at the risk of um, letting you know about... Um, what this whole topic is about. If you're not familiar with the concept of procrastination, um, just to start off here with a basic definition, it's the act of unnecessarily and voluntarily delaying or postponing something, despite knowing that there will be negative consequences for doing so. So this is always about the fact that there are things that we either know we have to do or need to do or it would be good for us to do in some particular way and where we actually have the freedom of action to do them but um, somehow or other we don't do it we, we, we make choices whereby we don't do it and as a result of that we end up with negative consequences by the way uh, to make an obvious point again these negative consequences are no surprise to us we sort of know them in advance before we procrastinate which of course makes it even more bizarre that we engage in this although of course we we enter into all sorts of denial and and thought suppression etc etc to try and minimize those known consequences but they they're, they're known to us in advance we know what is going to happen for example when we've got an essay that we've got to get in um, as a student by a certain time and we've left it to the last moment and we know it's going to mean that we're going to have to work through the night or you know we're going to end up with some some essay that's not as good as it might be we know that there are some negative consequences for doing this but we still do them and we do this as well outside in other in other range uh, in a whole range of other contexts too um just to um to emphasize the book again um there's um uh, it's a 200, 150 page manual available on Amazon, published a couple of years ago. And of course, we've got the course details here as well, which uh, Julia has mentioned to you. So um, what the actual book and also the course functions or, or focuses on is a program which is called Muscle. Um, and the eye is it's obviously both a monomic and also a metaphor as well, because the idea is, is that our aim with this particular course is to help you to develop your anti procrastination muscle and the muscle stands for motivate, UFI, spot, change, 
uh, learn and then engage. And I appreciate each of these um, requires opening up, um, which we will not be doing this evening. Come along to the course for that. But the one that I want to concentrate on this evening is the UFI, um, which no doubt you're already thinking, what does that stand for? And you will know before the end of the evening. But I will I'll hold my fire on that for the moment before I give you some background on this. I think that it's the it's the aspect of this program, which, in my experience, makes the biggest difference for people. Whether you can use it as a standalone or not, I think is up for grabs. Um, I think that there are other elements within the program which you need to do in terms of preparation very often. And in addition to that, there's some added add-ons as well, sort of icing on the cake to maximize your chances of success. But I think that you know, the single most central thing that tends to make the difference is, is the UFI. So let's just kick off with um, looking at what we actually mean when we say that people actually do procrastinate. And um, I've got a selection here of sort of common things, to be honest with you, which um, I, I guess these have primarily come up in terms of my work with clients. I'm sure that you'll be able to uh, to recognize some of these either in yourself or or if you're doing work with clients and you're interested in this from a client perspective, you'll notice those doing them uh, playing Candy Crush. Um, on the phone, um, going and seeing what food is in the cupboard or in the fridge, um, uh, just reading through emails. We know how fascinating emails are, don't we? Uh, we, on the one hand, complain about the number that we've received, but my goodness, there come times when we just want to read all of them, including the boring ones. And then there's the whole thing about just filling in forms. I don't know what it is, but I've often found that my clients just want to fill in something that normally they would ignore. But when they want to procrastinate, form filling is a sort of mindless activity which they're often drawn to. Going and grabbing coffee and just chatting to people, um, just generally ignoring what the task is, sticking our head in the sand, texting um, as well. And um, I've got down here Pornhub. This is that's a whole separate area that we won't have time to go into today. But certainly um, the engagement in pornography, um, more so for males than females, but it applies to both sexes, is a very, very common procrastinating activity, in fact. Um, so I'll, these are the, I'm sure you're familiar with all of these, but I just really wanted to sort of flag them up so that you could concentrate on them. Now, does it matter? Does it matter that we procrastinate? You know, I, I've, I've come across people who have sometimes said, um, well, we really ought to be taking life a bit easier. Actually, what we need is a bit more procrastination, a bit more putting stuff off rather than um, rather than less. I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. Um, I think I would totally support the idea that there are certain things that we should choose to leave until later. But we're not really talking about that because I think a lot of the time, the things that we do leave until later are actually the things that we ought to be doing now, in fact. Um, but that doesn't seem to make a difference to us. And it, it's very often, actually, the things that are most important to us that we procrastinate about. Um, and what sort of effects does it have? Well, I, I, at the sort of psychological level, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with all of this, stress, guilt, anxiety, indecisiveness and can I just say we'll come back to this point later on but the more you procrastinate the more indecisive you naturally become it's almost a strategy that's designed to encourage you and enable you to be more indecisive than you were before lack of confidence the same thing delayed life decisions I'm going to give you a brief example of this in a minute um, but very often decisions about career decisions about relationships get put off um, it's a real issue, I find, with clients in terms of their inability to engage in therapeutic tasks. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how many of you use therapeutic tasks with your clients, um, but um, it's very common if they don't complete those tasks to say, I don't know, it's just too busy or things got in the way or I didn't get round to it or I know I should have done it, but I didn't. And it, it actually, I suppose what I want to emphasize here is if you use therapeutic tasks in any way, um, it, it both potentially um, reduces the effectiveness of the therapy and also, of course, it, it delays it, 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 its completion. 
um, and also potentially delaying addressing issues in therapy as well. Um, I've certainly come across clients who just want to put certain issues off. They just don't want to be thinking about them, talking about them at the moment. Maybe later on, we might look at that, can't manage that at the moment and so on and so forth. And then in terms of what's occurring, typically, can I say, within the work life area, we know that there is a strong correlation between high levels of procrastination among students and poorer academic success. Um, students, of course, by the way, are um, the primary group that uh, practice procrastination. They're not the only group, but there is a particular reason, I think, why students tend to be particularly prone to this. Uh, we've also got good evidence, incidentally, in the career section of life that uh, you, there are substantial reductions in salary increases and promotions amongst people who procrastinate. We also know that very often the quality of decisions that are actually made, I'm thinking of particularly within the work context, are often poorer, which is not that surprising, really. If you leave a decision, an important decision, until the very last moment, um, are you really making the best decision based on the best evidence you've got? Or are you just rushing it at the end to get it out of the way? It also, of course, leads to a lot of time wasting. Um, I've often found, not universally, but some people who work um, very long hours and are workaholics are not necessarily people who are actually working for all of that time. They might be in their office or at their desk for a long period of time, but actually there's often quite high levels of procrastination activity that's occurring there. So actually, um, time is not, it's not, it's not managed well. You also, by the way, if you're going to be doing that, going to miss out on quality time. So, you know, the reality is, is that time that you're spending procrastinating could be spent on doing other things which are more of more value. And as a result of this, you end up working long hours. There's also issues around which we've got, again, good evidence on now about the relationship between um, procrastination and a whole range of general physical health problems. Um, at one particular level, as I put here, delaying in seeking medical help, um, I, I guess that this is a fairly obvious connection. If I keep on putting off going and seeing my doctor with particular symptoms, for instance, for whatever reason, then there's a greater chance that the severity of that illness will increase. We know as well that it often plays a role with people's problems with anxiety. Uh, people who are often anxious have a greater tendency to procrastinate, which often feeds in again to their anxiety too. It's a negative feedback loop. We know that this is connected with unhealthy lifestyles too. Very often, people who are the biggest procrastinators are the ones that are spending their days sitting on the sofa watching daytime TV, who are overeating, who are not taking exercise, and so on and so forth. And not surprisingly, these are particularly connected, we know now, with cardiovascular problems. So at a whole range of levels, whether we're talking the psychological level, the productivity work level, or whether we're talking at the health level, this is an issue which creates big problems. And I've just got three examples here of clients that I've certainly worked with in the past who manifested this as a problem in slightly different ways. So uh, Carl was a, a PhD uh, student who just was repeatedly failing to submit his thesis, partly related to his perfectionism and partly related to some of the issues he had with the imposter syndrome, but it was also related to his procrastination. He actually said that he was spending 10 hours a day working but when we actually looked and did a monitoring exercise and got him to keep a timetable of this, we were actually finding that in some instances he was spending two, four to five hours of that day when he was working, in inverted commas, actually playing Candy Crush, watching YouTube videos and watching online porn and texting friends. Um, and um, what I think the interesting thing about that was when I was working with him was he was on the one hand he 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 labeled himself as a hard worker because he was working so much time on this on this particular project and he sort of knew he procrastinated but he didn't really hadn't fully grasp the amount of time or degree to which he procrastinated and it was only after we did the monitoring exercise that he became more aware of it 
Um, I've got another example here with a socially anxious client, Bija, 15 year old, socially anxious, particularly in connection with blushing. For those of you with a CBT background, you will know it's not an uncommon behavioral experiment to set up with social anxiety blushing to actually uh, ask clients to do a behavioral experiment where they basically go into a public place um, such as a fast food takeaway or something like this and order something but with rouge actually placed on their cheeks in order to evaluate what the reaction is and this is to test out the person's beliefs about other people's reactions um, to their social anxiety and uh, we actually set up a behavioral experiment where she was going to be doing this in 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 kentucky fried chicken um, and she didn't do it she repeatedly came back over a number of sessions with excuses which varied she'd forgotten she was busy um, basically she extended time on social media with friends she was texting checking food in the fridge a whole variety of things which from her perspective meant that she didn't get around to doing it and this is something which in many instances can i say is a very simple therapy task which for a large number of clients would be completed in a single session. Uh, this took us four sessions to get to. And actually her therapeutic gains, generally speaking, were much more limited, um, even after 12 sessions. Um, the last example I just wanted to share was a life decision example. Um, this was uh, Geraldine, um, a woman who basically came along saying that she had problems with being indecisive and that she had some big issues that she'd been grappling with for a long period of time, which she knew, can I say, she knew what she wanted to do with these. It wasn't that she was indecisive about knowing what to do. She was indecisive about taking action over them. And actually, she actually said she'd raised the issue of separation with her husband three years before I'd first seen her. And they'd also mutually agreed in principle to separate shortly after that particular time. But they didn't inform their two children for 18 months and had actually both only gone to see solicitors for the first time six weeks prior to therapy. And when I actually said to Gerald, Geraldine, it feels to me like your life has been on hold for the last three years. It's, it's like you're waiting. You're not quite sure what you're waiting for. You know what you want to do, but you haven't done it. Am I right? And she says, yeah, the last three years have just been a total waste, to be honest. I've got to do something about it now. So they, I'm sure you come across other examples of this, but this is just to sort of illustrate uh, what it is. Now, you will not be short of books on procrastination. There's lots of them on Amazon, and I've just taken three out here fairly randomly as well, because these three books highlight what is a very common approach in the literature to trying to deal with procrastination, which is it's very common to actually see it as a time management problem. And I, I've circled some of the things on these three particular books. Can I just say I'm not recommending these books, for goodness sake, I hope you appreciate this. I'm sort of highlighting these particular books as the way of not going about it, but which is very commonly gone about within the literature. But as you can see um, in these three, uh, three books, which I think are fairly typical in many instances, they primarily are seeing procrastination as a time management problem. And the implication of that, by the way, of course, is that the solution to procrastination is to learn time management strategies and to start actually implementing them. Sorry, my slide went across there. Um, and there's a number of time management solutions which you're going to find written about. Um, I think very in many ways, they're not unique to procrastination. Um, you know, they, they come up and are commonly used uh, in, in a whole variety of other contexts. But they're ones that you may or may not be familiar with. You know, I suspect that everybody's familiar with goal setting as a concept, and certainly goal setting is commonly highlighted in many of these books. Uh, the 80-20 rule, if you're not familiar with this, basically 80% of what we achieve is, is obtained uh, through 20% of our input. Um, and on the basis of this, there is the idea of, well, basically, if you're leaving things until the last moment, because there seems to be so much that you have to do, uh, then basically, if you slim down and identify the most important elements in this, uh, you'll actually be able to, to achieve things much more quickly. 
Uh, the Pomodoro technique, I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is, um, it's, a, it's, I think, a Spanish term uh, for tomato, um, but it basically is about the use of a timer. I've got a picture here, obviously, of one. I actually quite like this, can I say, as a technique for working with. The way at which it works is you set the timer, typically for a period of 25 minutes, where you work consistently through that, and then when the alarm goes off, you take a break of five or 10 minutes and then you return to work and so on and so forth. And I, and I do think it's got some value, but I would be really surprised if it's going to make much difference to chronic procrastinators. Um, the um, Eisenhower matrix, uh, this is basically working out, I don't know if you've heard of this, working out what you have to do, what is urgent but unimportant, what is urgent but important, what is um, not urgent um, and, and important and what is not urgent and unimportant and so on and so forth. And it's a way of ordering the tasks that uh, you have to do. So basically you don't end up letting slipping off the edge, the things that typically of course are the ones that are most urgent and important. Um, Elon Musk has got, um, uh, is, is taken really as the most a uh, famous example of using a time blocking technique. I don't know if you're familiar with this, either the technique or Elon Musk's use of it. Um, but Elon Musk starts each day by breaking his day down in a timetable uh, into 30 and 60 minute chunks. And he identifies particular tasks for doing within that time. Obviously, um, uh, an extremely productive guy. Um, but um, nonetheless, I would be really surprised if it's going to do a great deal for someone who's a natural procrastinator. Um, so what I would want to say, broadly speaking, is I don't think that the solution to this problem is time management. It's not to say that time management strategies are not of value, but if you or your client's primary problem is one of procrastination, sadly, this is unlikely to produce a solution for you. There's another common explanation that's given for people who procrastinate, which is about their inability to delay gratification, or what is often described as being the failure to pass the marshmallow test. Now, you probably, or at least some of you, will be familiar with the Stanford University um, experiment that was originally conducted back in 1972, although interestingly enough, there's been a recent failure to replicate it. But the principle is one that's well known and still influences a lot of people's thinking. In the original experiment, basically a young child is placed on a table and they have a marshmallow placed in front of them and they are given a choice. Uh, basically, you can either have the marshmallow now or alternatively, if you can wait for 15 minutes, uh, you're going to get two marshmallows. And it's been found, at least in the original experiment, that the children who were able to delay gratification and obtain a bigger reward in 15 minutes with the two marshmallows basically showed much higher scores at subsequent points in their life over everything from well-being to educational attainment and career attainment. And this is often being used and still is used, I think, in many ways to describe the problem that procrastinators have, which is that basically people procrastinate because they're not willing to put off their pleasure. They want it now and they can't delay gratification. Now, I think that there is a grain of truth in this, but it is an unfair description. So let's just have a look at why I think this has got something to offer, because it does actually lead into what I think is the primary problem with procrastination, and as a result of that, what the solution actually is. So I've got down here a list, as you can see, of common procrastinating activities. I'm sure you've got your own that you could add to that. They obviously overlap with the list that I gave you beforehand. Social media is obviously on here too as well now. And people have got various goals, um, which might be academic, they might be work-related, uh, they might be financial, they might be goals that they have for uh, their health and fitness, they might be goals that they actually have for their family and their personal relationships. And in order for people to, to reach these, and we've all got these, of course, to varying degrees, we have to do things um, in order to get there. 
And uh, this particular sort of metaphor is basically suggesting quite rightly that actually we often don't get there and achieve those things that are important to us because we engage in these activities which um, are procrastinating in nature. Now, have a think about this. When you look at this list of things that I've got here, which of these could really be seen as being so pleasurable that they're so powerful to take us away from key goals and tasks? Just have a think about it. You know, if we take one here that I've got that I didn't have on the previous list, which is about cleaning the house. Um, is this such an enormously pleasurable task that, for example, if you take someone like Geraldine and Geraldine, you know, when I said, what do you do to try and put off this decision? She says, I seem to become a bigger cleaner over the last three years. Is it really the case that if I was to say to Geraldine, wow, the attraction of cleaning the house must be so great and so pleasurable and so powerful that it can stop you making what is undoubtedly a very, very powerful life decision of whether to separate from your husband or not. And she looked at me like, not surprisingly, like I'm a fool. But can I just say all of these things are actually not especially pleasurable or joyful? I mean, I've got to have a very sad life if I get very excited about the prospect of playing Candy Crush this afternoon. I've got to have a very sad life indeed if I actually think that scrolling through emails is a great joy, which is so addictive for me that I'm going to leave other more important things to one side. So what I just want to say here, and I think this is a really important point to bear in mind, procrastinating activities are clearly powerful, and I do think they're powerful, and I'll come back to the idea that procrastination is an addiction in a minute, but it's not about giving pleasure. It's not about giving pleasure. It's, you know, when I go to the fridge, when I'm in the middle of doing some work and I go to the fridge to check what food is in there, another common procrastinating activity, does that give me enormous joy and pleasure? Of course not. But something about it is quite powerful. So what is that actually about? Well, broadly speaking, my argument is, is that procrastination is very addictive. And I've already mentioned in a strange way, like all addictive behaviors, the more you do it, the more addictive it becomes. Is because it operates through negative reinforcement. So let me just point out what I, I mean by this, because it's a really important point to grasp. Why we procrastinate is not because of the pleasure of the activity that we procrastinate with. It's more to do with the feelings that we have about the task or the decision that we are engaged in before we procrastinate. And broadly speaking, broadly speaking, procrastination is generated through either anxiety or boredom. Is either about anxiety or boredom. So as I'm sitting there filling in my traveling expenses at the end of the month, one of the most tedious and boring exercises I can ever think of, um, I just think I'll go and check what's in the fridge. Now, what's really interesting about this is we know that it, that, that, behavior doesn't just take away the boredom or for some people the anxiety that they're feeling it does it extremely quickly it does it extremely quickly and one of the key principles of behavioral theory for those of you that um, I, I hope some of you are at least familiar with behavioral theory but one of the things that we know with behavioral theory is that the more immediate a consequence is the more powerful it is. So the more immediate effect that a behavior has on something, the more addictive it becomes. I, for those of you that have done the introductory CBT course with me, for example, you will remember me going through the whole idea that different levels of gambling are differentially addictive because of the degree of delay between placing the bet and getting a result. And it's the key reason, for example, why slot machines, 
for instance, are more addictive, for instance, than poker, because there's a, a shorter delay between putting my money in and discovering a result than there would be in a poker game. And this is the interesting thing about procrastinating behavior. And I find it quite fascinating. If I'm trying to do some work on a computer screen and I'm feeling anxious or bored by my task, as soon as I go and look at my e emails, which I have no interest in, as soon as I go and look at those, that boredom or anxiety disappears immediately. This makes it a very addictive behavior. Now, we know with all addictive behaviors, and I use the term obviously quite broadly here, and I would apply this obviously to things like a lot of eating problems. I would apply it as well um, to, uh, to instances like uh, deliberate self-harm through cutting, um, as well as the more obvious addictive behaviors. We know that these particular things work in the short term, but their effects are short-lived. And that's why you've got to go back and do it again and again and again. And that's why when you are caught up with a piece of work and you're feeling very anxious about whether you're going to be doing it right or you're going to be making the right decision and you go and check what's in the fridge, the anxiety goes like that. But as soon as you've checked what's in the fridge and you come back and sit down, the benefits of that distraction don't last and you're immediately confronted again by the bad feelings. So what I think is important to bear in mind here, and the, and, and the key really, I think, to understanding procrastination and then subsequently thinking about how to intervene and work with it, is that basically procrastination serves a very powerful function about taking away bad feelings. It takes away bad feelings, most commonly anxiety or boredom. Now, I'm just about very shortly to contradict what I've just said regarding boredom and anxiety, but that's the basic psychological principles that it's fundamentally based on. Now, I used this an acronym earlier on of UFI, which we use within the training program and is used within the book. And that stands for uncomfortable feelings intolerance. Now, the idea, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, the idea for this comes from dialectical behavior therapy, where there is a focus on distress intolerance skills. OK, and that part of DBT is about basically teaching people skills to enable them to tolerate distress or bad feelings more effectively. Now, although I think the basic principle is applicable here, I am quite wary of saying that individuals who procrastinate are automatically ones who are anxious or exceedingly bored. Because when you think, well, let me take you, you the example of me. If I'm sitting doing some work on my computer screen and I don't know exactly what I should be doing, or if I'm feeling a bit bored, um, with doing it, I have to be honest with you, those feelings are not, I, I think it's stretching the term to say that I'm anxious. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Um, I'm feeling a bit maybe irritable. I'm feeling a bit mm, not too sure. But to start describing this as anxiety feels to me to be too strong a term. Because there are lots and lots of instances, can I say, when we go through our working and living day, where we also engage and experience uncomfortable feelings. We do. We do this all the time. When I go and stand on the edge of the curb to cross the road, and I'm looking for cars coming, and they're coming quite fast, and I'm having to make decisions about when I cross over or don't cross over, I feel uncomfortable but I wouldn't be feeling too happy about describing myself as an anxious road crosser. So in a way, my concern is, is that the term anxiety is too powerful a word. And it also, by the way, what it also does is it makes it sound like the problem is a very difficult one to overcome. 
And I don't think it is. I think that actually what we're talking about here is an intolerance of uncomfortable feelings. Now, as you probably already spotted, for those of you with a behavioral background, you will recognize then, particularly with this statement about negative reinforcement, that basically procrastination is an avoidance behavior. And one of the things we know about avoidance generally is the more we avoid something, and we tend to avoid perceived threat, by the way, the more we avoid something, the bigger the threat becomes in our minds. And actually, what I think has happened in many instances for chronic procrastinators is they have become so used to avoiding uncomfortable feelings when they're confronted by a task that they increasingly are convinced that they have an anxiety problem which prevents them doing things. Now, in a way, they're being, they're, it's, it's accurate, but it's not the task that's making them anxious. It's their response to the task which is making them anxious. It's the fact that they use avoidance as a response, which is actually creating the problem. And it also, not surprisingly, as it is the case with anything that we repeatedly avoid doing, we increasingly lose confidence in our ability to handle it. So what you'll get here very often with chronic procrastinators who have become anxious because they procrastinated for so long is they also have a natural tendency to catastrophize and, and engage in some of the weirdest thinking. I mean, I, 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 you must come across procrastinators and you yourself may be like this, who says the only way I can complete something is if I leave it up to the last moment and being petrified forces me to do it. Now, are you really saying that, for example, writing an essay is so anxiety provoking that you can't make the decision yourself to engage in it, that you have to expect and rely on external circumstances to force you to do it. Because this sounds to me very much like some of the things that folks will say when they have a, a substance addiction problem. I can only go and talk with people if I get drunk beforehand, that, that sort of thing. So what I just want to emphasize here is, yes, I think that procrastination is an avoidance strategy, which is used in order to avoid uncomfortable feelings. But the more you do it, those uncomfortable feelings end up getting amplified. And I start feeling anxious about a task, which historically I didn't feel anxious about at all, but which I now feel anxious about. And in the process, I lose my confidence in my actual ability to actually tackle it. So bearing those particular things in mind, I guess the key question is, is what do you do about it? And this is what I would argue is my answer. And I, 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 I want to broaden this out, really, and say, because I don't just want to talk about this in connection with procrastination, although this is one of the exercises that we actually have in the actual uh, training program and in, the, and in the therapy treatment program as well, which is basically um, an imaginal introspective exposure exercise. Um, what I want to say, generally speaking, is that the more we engage in procrastination, obviously the more disabled we become. We see more things as threats, our confidence about doing things generally goes down. However, the more we expose ourselves to the feared perceived threat, or to, to any type of perceived feared threat, by the way, the more we experience the fact that we can expose ourselves to this, and most importantly, it does not destroy us, we actually discover, first of all, that we can survive it. And then we can actually discover not only can we survive it, but actually the experience of doing it wasn't quite as bad as we feared it might be. And then we repeat it again and so on and so forth. 
And there's a lovely piece of research, which I, I haven't got time to go through with you this evening, um, about goal setting amongst old, older people over the age of 65. Um, and um, one of the things that's really quite interesting about this is that these goals in, in, in the study that was actually conducted are not necessarily major goals. They're just doing something which is different on a daily basis that takes you outside your comfort zone, basically. So what I would argue is, is yes, it's useful to think about exposing yourself to a particular task that you're putting off. And I'll just briefly go through this exercise in a minute to illustrate it to you. But there's a broader principle here, what I would like to leave you with really as a thought, both for yourself and also for your clients, is to encourage your clients and yourself to put yourself into a mildly uncomfortable position regarding something on a daily basis. This can I say, I hope you can see the similarities here with exercise. And it's one of the reasons why we use that muscle technique as a monomic in this particular treatment program. Because the reality is, is if you've not been doing any exercise, you get flabby and even walking to the bus stop, you think, my God, I can't even manage that. I can't do it. I need to get into the car. But actually, if you start off small and you do it frequently and repeatedly, not only do you discover that you can do it, but you also discover that the initial discomfort that you felt when you did it for the first time totally disappears. And then you can extend it and can extend it and can extend it. And for the things that we need to do on a regular and daily basis, they automatically become, first of all, things that we can do without procrastinating. We can, with enough practice, do this without even thinking about them. And to borrow a statement from a good friend and colleague of mine, who's also interested in the procrastination field. He said to me once, Paul, I know when my clients have been totally cured of their procrastination problem, because then they become anxious about not doing things rather than anxious about doing them. And I think that's not a bad test actually. When you've got things that you know you have to do, and actually your anxiety is you want to get them out the way so they're not hanging over you, and therefore you take action, you know you've solved it. So just to run through this exercise, which we won't be doing this evening because of time, but I would encourage you to try out for yourself, really. Um, which is to go to a task that you've been picturing yourself having to do. All of us sitting here will have a task, at least one task that we think is hanging over us. And which there's been a tendency to procrastinate about. I've mentioned exercise three here because this comes from the program. But what I say to people is I want you to picture yourself doing the task rather than procrastinating. And while you're looking at this picture, to feel that feeling that you typically have when you are doing the task, okay? So if we take the simple example of doing an essay for academic study, and the thought of doing the essay makes us feel anxious or bored, and that would be when we would have our natural gut instinct to procrastinate. What I would encourage you to do is to continue to picture yourself now engaging in that task. But also allowing yourself to feel the anxiety or boredom while you're doing it. So don't run away from it. Don't try and escape the picture. Indeed, try to examine the picture in as great a detail as possible. And notice as much detail as possible as you can, including observing yourself doing the task. So if this is the more concrete that you can make this, the better. 
So if it's a writing task, what it would be that you would be writing, what part of it you'd be concentrating on. And I'd like you to do this for a total of five minutes. Notice how short this is as an exercise, the five minutes. But what I'd like you to do while you're picturing yourself doing this task for five minutes is I would like you to rate how uncomfortable you feel on a minute by minute basis. OK, so I'd like you to rate out of 10 how uncomfortable you feel at the beginning, after one minute, after two minutes, after three minutes, after four minutes. And finally, after five minutes, OK, while still this is very important, while still picturing yourself doing the actual task and trying to continuously hold it in your mind's eye. I can near enough guarantee now that if you do that, there will be a substantial reduction in the scores over a short period of time of five minutes. Now, I'm not saying, can I say, that they will go down to zero. But they will be not as high as they were in anticipation of you picturing yourself doing the task. And secondly, your attitude to this, you will notice slightly changes. The first thing that you will notice is that you could actually survive picturing yourself doing this. It wasn't so unpleasant that, you know, you had to get up and go and do something else. You may actually think, well, my discomfort went down to four, but it didn't go down to zero. But what's interesting is, is four out of 10 as a rating of discomfort or feeling uncomfortable is not the end of the world. You know, I often feel a four out of 10 about a whole range of things. Um, so in that respect, um, I can see how I can now tolerate this if I can see some advantages from doing this that I didn't notice earlier. The only people in my experience who go through this exercise, and I do need to warn you of this, folks, the only people in, in my experience who go through this exercise and do not see a reduction are the ones who end up not holding the picture in their head over the five minutes. In other words, they engage in experiential avoidance whilst doing the exercise. Now, what they do is very variable. A lot of people just try to use thought suppression. Um, and they, um, a bit like the, the ostrich that you saw sticking its head in the sand. Some people try and think of something more pleasant. Some people, of course, just give up altogether. Um, but that's where you're going to have your problems. As long as you can keep the picture in your mind for a total of five minutes, you will actually find that your level of discomfort substantially declines within that period. And I can say now that if you want a useful therapeutic strategy, I would argue to use with clients in a whole variety of settings and with problems, encouraging them to do something which leads them to feel mildly uncomfortable on a daily basis in order to stretch themselves helps to develop that uncomfortable feelings tolerance, which is what we're looking for. Right, folks. Well, I hope that you've got some um, useful ideas with that. I don't know if there's any questions at all that have come up. Julia. Oh yes, yes. I, I I wanted to actually have a chance to, to say a few words at the end, because um, I think there is a theme developing with questions. Uh, quite a few people were writing to me asking about procrastination and ADHD. Right. Okay. And whether there will be similar exercises and similar approaches. Uh, which uh, can be used with ADHD. I must say that Fiona is coming to your course. Oh, right. So what I want to say now 
please be ready because right, fine. to every exercise Fiona will be saying, what about ADHD clients? So please can I say something briefly, yes. If yeah, you can I say something for other, for other that, people if you say without that. going into detail. Mm -hmm. If I have ADHD, this is not something which is totally and utterly outside of my control, which I cannot do things to moderate. And if that is the case, then it's also the case with procrastination as well. I'm not saying that the challenges are potentially not greater, but what I would challenge is the idea that if someone has ADHD, this is actually totally outside of their control. And in that respect, there, it, there are additional things with ADHD that you can do, but a lot of the things that we'll be looking at may require more practice or take longer to implement if you have ADHD but they are there's a big overlap here so yeah sorry just wanted to briefly say that sorry there are other questions uh, uh, I also wanted just to mention my own observation when you were doing this exercise at the end and you said notice that you need to sit and have that picture in your mind only for five minutes yeah I was filled with dread to sit and have some picture in my mind for five minutes young people can't sit 30 seconds without looking at their phone yeah so i was just thinking that that exercise probably could be very good to combine with mindfulness yes so undoubtedly. Of, to have it more like mindfulness sitting but bringing your mind back to that picture so the, because because yeah. just sitting and having an image in my head for far i can tell you i can't do it Okay, so a few things to just say about that. Mm. Um, the first thing is, is there are some folks that need some preparatory work before they can get into this. Um, mm. And there are some clients that I would work with where we would basically be asking them just to get used to experiencing being emotionally uncomfortable in non-problem related areas of their life in order to help them develop what I would describe as a slightly thicker psychological skin hmm. prior to them doing an imaginal exposure exercise like this. But there are other things that can obviously be done as well. Um, mindfulness is one way in which you can help people, obviously, to begin to tolerate that particular prospect. I am going to come back, however, and oh, sorry, a third thing we can obviously do, which is commonly used with imaginal exposure, is that we can start off with the image being blurred and distant, and we can bring it into greater focus and closer to the person. So there are a variety of lead ins that we can use with this. You're quite right. Um, and in practice, I, I would often be doing, not as often as I would necessarily expect, by the way. I, 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 I've got to come back and say that I think, you know, it, it, I think that the more one procrastinates, the bigger the scariness is of picturing the activity that one's procrastinating about. Yeah. And actually a large amount of, 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 of what's built up here is anticipatory anxiety that's been maintained through avoidance, really. Um, and that even if, for example, what I might start off with some people doing is to ask them to hold the picture in their head for 30 minutes. Ask the 30 minutes, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, it's and, then, and, then, and then slowly increasing it. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking yeah. that maybe gradual increase can yeah. also be used for this. Um, just very quickly, uh, Diane made two very interesting points, and I haven't read her the l latest one, but uh, about anorexia and binge eating as and as procrastination strategies. I thought that was fascinating and definitely requires uh, further uh, further discussion. And also, people were asking people who can't come to the course in January because they already have clients. They're asking when we're running it again. We're usually trying to run it at the end of January every year. But what I do after the course done, I usually send an email to you giving an absolutely ridiculous anti-procrastination discount saying commit to this course for next year now and 
pay, I don't know, something like just 20%, 25% of the course price. And lots of people I know booked that early and waited for a year to be prepared for the next Makes course. sense, doesn't it? It's a good program. Yeah, so, so basically, have a look. Uh, uh, keep an eye on your emails. And if you can't come this year, you will receive an email with a huge discount for the next year course. So you can uh, uh, attend it that way. So I hope that uh, although Paul tried, as always, to cover as much of the course as possible in tonight's it's session. A small but amount. I know, but the course is two days and it's just full of exercises which you are doing yourself. So if you're interested, we still have places. Uh, it's a small group course, uh, so but we still have a few places. So if you're interested, please come. And next week, we are meeting again next week because after that it's Burns Night, so we are letting you all to have your huggies. So next week, uh, we are uh, uh, welcoming here Andrew Beck, a former president of BABCP, and he will be talking about how to get your best, how to get the best out of your supervisor. So uh, again, that'll be a very practical session with Andrew Beck. So I hope to see you all next week. You can unmute yourself and say your goodbyes and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Be careful. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank